All right, y'all, morning. Good to see you. Everybody got their coffee, whatever they need to rock and roll here because we're going to turn on the fire hydrant and drink what we can. Uh, we'll be videoed, and so you can go back. You can go over the, uh, these things more slowly if you need to and think about them because we're going to push through lots of material in 12 weeks. Lots of material. I, I would pass Allison at home, and I'd say, if you have any ideas about how to cover the whole Old Testament in 12 weeks, let me know. And she'd be like, what are you talking about? Like, just help me. Josh texted me last night. He's like, you ready, bro? I went to text back. Is that tomorrow? Man. Pressure all the time. <laughs> okay. All right, well, we'll just dive in. Today's just kind of introductory, and it's, it's kind of a wide-ranging overview of what we're doing, why we're doing, what we're doing in a course like this. So just uh, just take in all you can. I, um, I read a while back about a candidate for church membership who was asked, what part of the Bible do you like best? And his first reply was, well, I like the New, New Testament best. <laughs> and so they probed a little more, and they asked him, okay, but what book in the New Testament's your favorite? And he said, well, the book of parables. So the, 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 the membership committee said, well, tell us one of those parables. And so he said, once upon a time, lots of parables start that way, right? Once upon a time, a man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, and the thorns grew up and choked the man. And he went on and met the queen of Sheba, and she gave that man a thousand talents of silver and a hundred changes of raiment. And he got in his chariot and drove furiously. And he was driving along under a big tree. His hair got caught in a limb and left him hanging there. And he hung there many days and many nights. And the ravens brought him food to eat and water to drink. And then one night, while he was hanging there asleep, hanging there asleep, his, uh, his wife, Delilah, came along, cut off his hair. And he fell on stony ground. And, he be and it began to rain, and it rained 40 days and 40 <laughs> nights. And he hid himself in a cave. Later on, he went on and met a man who said, Come in and take supper with me. But he said, I can't come in, for I've married a wife. And the man went out into the highways and hedges and compelled him to come in. Then he came to Jerusalem and saw Queen Jezebel sitting high, lifted up in the window of a wall. When she saw him, she laughed, and he said, Throw her down out of there. And they threw her down. He said, throw her down again. And they threw her down 70 times 7. <laughs> and the fragments which they picked up filled 12 baskets full. <laughs> now, whose wife will she be in the day of judgment? <laughs> and the membership committee all agreed he was indeed a knowledgeable candidate. <laughs> so he was just like, well, there's a blistering tour of the Bible, but in no way that puts the Bible together in, in any way that makes any sense. That's kind of an exaggeration, I know, but it's, it speaks to something, too. You know, I read a book sometime back that was both fascinating and terrifying. It was by a guy named Stephen Prothero, who is the chair of the Department of Religion at Boston University. And, I mean, by any academic standards, this guy's got some pretty impressive credentials, which means he does speak with some authority, and he does speak with some expertise on the particular topic of that book. And the title of the book was Religious Literacy. Now, we can't, we can't do a review of the whole book, but he caught my attention by starting off saying, Americans are both deeply religious and profoundly ignorant about religion. That was like one of his first sentences. I was like, 
man, okay, here we go. And the facts he goes on to present in the book are just distressing. He says, American, Americans' knowledge of religion runs as shallow as Americans' commitment to religion runs deep. In fact, most Americans lack the most basic understanding of their own religious tradition. And then he quoted a guy, R. Lawrence Moore, who's a um, uh, historian, who said Americans are, this just hurt when I read it, Americans are stupefyingly dumb about what they're supposed to believe. <laughs> like, well, okay. And, and while that makes us really uncomfortable, the facts really are incontestable. You know, at pulpit reading speed, and I've heard, I've heard uh, Pastor Josh mention this before, at pulpit reading speed, you can read the whole Bible through, the whole Bible through in about 72 hours. That's out loud, reading which incidentally is about the same amount of time that the average American spends watching television every 18 days. And so that means at a comfortable speed at that rate, it's possible to read the whole Bible all the way through 20 times a year. 72 hours every 18 days. Or you can watch that much television. You can do that too. What if we did just a quarter of that? What if we read the Bible through five times a year? What difference would that make? A lot, I think. But here we are, as Susan Jacoby notes, here we are in a society where people read fewer and fewer books of any kind, including the book they consider to be the Word of God. So that reality... I mean, that's a reality we face in our culture. That reality, coupled with the biblical call throughout the Bible for us to know our God, for us to grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus, for us to contend for the faith, that is, for the specific content of Christian belief, once and for all delivered to the saints, for us to destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. For us to always be prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks us a reason for the hope that's in us. For us to make every effort, for us to do our best to present ourselves before God as proven workers who do not need to be ashamed teaching the message of truth accurately, and so much more. All of that, the reality we face, all these calls in Scripture, all of that, the whole cause of God and truth in the world is what has led to this right here, to the Institute at Fortified Hills and the, the, um, the focused, concentrated effort to make mature disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ by teaching all that he's commanded. That is, the whole counsel of God as it's revealed in the whole Bible. That's, that's really not an elective course in the Christian life. You ever noticed how much the Bible has to say about the truth with the definite article, the truth? It's the truth known that sets us free, right? John 8. Jesus himself is the truth as well as the life and the way. And no one comes to the Father except through him. The Spirit of God is the Spirit of truth who guides us into all the truth. John 16. We are sanctified in the truth. John 8, uh, John 17, which is the word of God. Jesus came into the world to bear witness to 
the truth, John 18. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of people who do what? Suppress the truth in unrighteousness. In fact, Paul tells us that for those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, there will be wrath and fury. We'll get to that in Romans 2. Love does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Those who are perishing are characterized in 2 Thessalonians 2 as those who refused to love the truth. We are saved through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth, 2 Thessalonians 2. The church is called the pillar and foundation, the support of the truth. 1 Timothy 3. False teachers are said to find fruitful ground for their heresies among people who are depraved in mind and deprived of the truth. 1 Timothy 6, the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone, able to teach, patiently enduring evil, correcting his opponents with gentleness, so that, we read, God may perhaps grant them repentance, leading to a knowledge of the truth, which is their only hope. Paul warns Timothy about the day when a whole breed of religious folks are going to dominate the scene, characterized by all sorts of foolishness, of whom he says at one point they are always learning and never able to arrive at a knowledge of the truth. In fact, the whole solemn charge to preach the word in season and out is given in the context of a time coming when people will not endure sound teaching. But having itching ears, they'll accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions, and they will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. The writer to the Hebrews warns us, if we go on sinning deliberately after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sin. John's told us in his first letter, if we say we have fellowship with him, that is with God, while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. If we say we have no sin, he goes on to say, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. In fact, he says, whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. So with John, any pastor worth his salt, any pastor after God's own heart, is going to readily say with John, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. And I, I mean, that's a sample. That's a summary sample of what the Bible has to say about the truth. So our aim in a course like this, this course in the Institute, is both expositional and it's theological. I mean, we do want to learn how to read and understand our Bibles well. Uh, but it's also devotional and practical. It, it's our, our coming to be shaped by the true story that we really are in. And so to live in a manner worthy of the gospel to the praise of and the glory of God. We want to throw away all our, our own terrible little script that we've written. You got that with you, just crumple it up, throw it away. We want to throw away our third-rate efforts at a life movie. And we want to find our place in God's great drama of redemption, right? I mean, who, who likes a good story? Okay, you can move. I, mean, I, I love good story. And what makes a good story? Well, just the right combination of uh, a, a lot of things, including drama 
and structure and memorable characters and a coherent plot with related subplots maybe and conflict and tension that is often personified in some antagonist, some reprehensible character who's just wreaking havoc in the world and a captivating beginning to the story and a stunning ending to the story. And all through the story, there's the hero, hoped for but surprising, the, the one person no one expects, who in the darkest moments of apparent defeat triumphs over the enemy through a startling and astounding reversal that you didn't see coming. And all is made right again. Man, that makes, that makes for a good story. That makes for the kind of story with which we can readily identify. Because it's a story that rings true deep in our own longings. Our longings are, if only. Oh, if only we could live in the good old days. If only things weren't so bad now. If only... A better world was ahead. If only somebody, anybody could do something to change everything for good. If only everything bad and sad could be made untrue. If only, if only that were the story, then, then we might have hope. Is there such a story? One, one based on actual events. <laughs> One that's true to the way things really are, in which we can find our place. Well, as it turns out, and you knew I was going to say this, right? The Christian story <laughs> revealed in the Bible is precisely that story. And unlike every other story about mythological folklore heroes on offer, Everything from the ancient stories about Hercules and Prometheus and Perseus all the way to the latest entries in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Everything. Unlike all of that, the Bible story is the true story about the way things really are. And all the other stories are either but echoes of this story or they are antitheses. They are opposites to this story. Think about the movies. I mean, movies tell stories, right? Some tell better stories than others. Some make more sense than others. Some are better produced than others. Some are better acted than others. But they all tell stories. And here's the thing. Every story is informed by some view of life in the world. Right? You get that? That means there's no such thing as a neutral movie. Every choice made from what kinds of characters to create to what kinds of events to include in the movie and what kind to exclude from the movie, everything is determined by somebody's Worldview, how they think things are, how they think they know how things are, how they think we ought to live in light of what they think they know about what they think things are. Everybody operates on this. The world some way, I know it this way, and therefore I should live like this. Um, those are just the great philosophical categories, metaphysics, epistemology, and ethics. Uh, and, and you may not be familiar with those words at all, but everybody lives this way. Every story is told in light of that in some way or another. All, and all these worldviews that, that everybody has, they are all essentially religious. That's why some have compared movie going to religious endeavor. Jeffrey Hill says, as modern worshipers, we congregate at the cinematic temple and we pay our votive offerings at the box office. And then we go in and we buy our ritual corn. <laughs> right? And we hush 
in reverent anticipation as the lights go down and the celluloid magic begin. And throughout the filmic narrative, we identify with the hero and we vilify the anti-hero and we vicariously exult in the victories of the drama and we're spiritually inspired by the moral of the story. All the while believing that we are modern techno-secular people who are devoid of religion. <laughs> the irony's delicious. Movies tell stories. Stories are shaped by worldviews. Worldviews are inherently religious. And so the movies are asking and answering the same ultimate questions the Christian story is addressed. What's the world really like? What's gone wrong in the world? Because clearly something has. Who can fix what's gone wrong in the world? How should we live in such a world? Is there any hope for a better world? These are echoes of the Bible's true story. How many of you way back when, talking about how old I am a little while ago, just hurts to say, how many of you saw the movie The Matrix? Well, pretty good number of people. Neo is a name that means new, right? It's also an anagram. You can rearrange the letters. It means one. He's the new one. He's the new man who, according to the movie, is the chosen one who's been prophesied. This gets better and better. He's prophesied to come and free the people from the crushing, oppressive, death-dealing system that has dominated and tyrannized everybody from birth. And when people finally are awakened from, when they are enlightened to their bondage, they're literally like born again to see the world like it really is. And those people who are thus freed from the delusion of the matrix, where do they go? They go to a city named Zion. <laughs> Just better and better. <laughs> Neo's finally betrayed by a guy who'd seen the light but decided to against it and rejected the truth, and he sacrifices his life. But then he comes back resurrected by a kiss by the breath of someone named Trinity. And he immediately defeats the enemy. And then at the end of the movie, he puts on his last scene. He puts on his cool shades. You remember that? He looks up. What does he do? He ascends into the sky. Any of that sound familiar? The echoes of the story may be even offered as a substitute for the story. Other stories are antithetical to the Christian story, and often intentional. They, they, they mean to contradict and to contravene the truth of the Christian story of the world. Why? Because that's a great part of the battle that's underway for your mind. To tell you another story so that you live another way than God has said. I mean, it's just as what what the tempter does in the garden, right? He introduces an opposing theoria. He introduces a divergent speculation about reality, a counter worldview. He says, did God actually say this? And Eve says, yeah, God said that. To which the tempter then basically says, it's not so. What God said would happen, won't happen. Let me tell you another story. And that's what he does. See, the integrity of what God has said is the issue. It's always been the issue. Is what God has said the truth? Is his story the true story about reality? Or is there some other story? And the danger involved 
in this conflict of worldviews is much more real in the greater scheme of things than likely we've ever imagined. We really are engaged in a cosmic warfare that has in the end the most tremendous and peculiar consequences that are both unchangeable and eternal. We have to get this right. One of the many opposing worldviews on offer out here, it's once broadly popular, it's called existentialism. It's got some basic tenets to it, some basic principles to it, things like, like a chance over destiny, um, experience over reason, uh, freedom over rules. These are basic operating principles of existentialism. And you don't have to look far to find these notions deeply at work in our culture and being proclaimed in the stories and the cultures being proselytized by the stories that many of these movies tell. You, you want that existentialist tenet of chance over destiny, uh, then just watch Forrest Gump. His whole life is chance. None of it's planned. Everything he ends up just, just happens to be by chance. He ends up in all these things. And there's an emphasis on this existentialist principle. Don't think movie, th movie makers aren't thinking about these things and promoting these ideas because that's exactly what they're doing. If you want the experience over reason, one Titanic's a great movie for that. If you want this one, Freedom Over Rules, um, this was one antithetical story espousing this principle in a, in a movie. It came out back at the end of the... 90s, 1998, I think. It was called Pleasantville. I don't know if you ever saw that. Interesting movie. It was striking in its opposition to the Christian story. And it's the tale of two 1990s Gen Xers, you know, brother and sister, who find themselves magically transported into the world of an old black and white television show show's name was Pleasantville. And um, the obvious intent of the filmmakers is to attack traditional morality as you would find it, say, in 1950s, Ozzie and Harriet, Leave it to Beaver, that kind of stuff. The whole point is to, is to attack those ideas. The movie's message is that such a thing as that, that kind of 1950s morality, which, of course, at least had its roots in the Christian story, that kind of thing is repressive to individual freedom. And, and we just can't have that. That's the thrust of the movie. And so, you know, through the course of the movie, these black and white people, with the help of these 1990s Gen Xers who've been transported into Pleasantville, they start to make personal choices against the rules and against society's norms and against order. They start to break all the rules. This is about freedom over rule. They begin to break the rules, many of which, like I say, are rooted in Christian morality. And that's when, when they break the rules, is when they turn into full-color people. They're no longer black and white, no longer flat people, black and white. They turn into full-color people. And here's the thing, the, these choices that they make in the movie, the thing that makes them full-color, or you could read that as fulfilled, the thing that makes them fulfilled people, well-rounded, fleshed-out, full-color people, are choices for things like premarital sex, adulterous sex. It, it's all these kinds of choices like that. It, expressions of freedom through immorality. And that's what makes you a, a full-color person. In one scene in the movie, a girl reaches up and plucks a big old red apple off a tree. Does that bring any stories to mind? It's in color. It's not black and white. 
to eat that. It's clearly a symbolic pointer to Genesis 3 and the fall in the Garden of Eden, except the message in the movie is this is not bad, this is good. To do, to make that decision is to become a full color person, is to really become all that you can, all that you can be. What happened in Eden was positive. Not negative. It was, it was positive growth for humanity. It was good. It wasn't bad. Because by choosing to eat the fruit, Adam and Eve were actually taking an enlightened step of maturity. They're making their own choices. They're not just following some rules. Not just following some rigid forms of morality imposed from the outside. Even if, as in their case, it was by God himself. And that's the message of the movie really quite a stunning scene. In fact, Pleasantville doesn't merely attack morals. It offers the proposition that all external norms, all rules of any kind are oppressive, and redemption is found only in rebelling against them all, in questioning all authority. And you make in your own internal individual choices. Do, do we see that at work anywhere in our culture? The rules of science don't really apply to me. I'll, I'll be whatever kind of gender I want. No kind of rules apply to me. I, I'll, just, I'll make up pronouns I want to use. I mean, this principle is where freedom over rules. Redemption is found. Maturity is found. Full color fulfillment is found in me just making my own decisions and, you know, not paying attention to anything else. No rules, no order, no anything, no authority. I question everything. I do what I want. And uh, we're, reaping, we're reaping the consequences, that kind of thing. And 20 years now after Pleasantville comes out, um, we're, we're seeing this at work in our culture. Redemption doesn't lie in making a moral decision. No, no. It lies only in you making your own decision, whatever it is, quite apart from any rules. It, it's just a lie of the garden again. So, you know, I, te- I say all, we could do a whole course on worldviews in movies, I guess. But I, I tell you this, first of all, to alert you to this kind of things going on. It's going on all the time. There is a war on for your mind, for how you think and what you think and what story you think you're in. That, that war is raging. We cannot miss this stuff. Stories matter, and life is lived well or not based on whether it's aligned to the true story of the world and life or not. So there, there really is a comprehensive story that runs through, that binds together, makes sense of the whole Bible and of life and the world. It's a story that's true to the way things really are. And that's what we're exploring in this course, which we've, of course, called the Christian story. This warfare for our minds and so for our lives is nothing new. I mean, this hadn't just recently popped up with the advent of YouTube and Twitter and Facebook, sometimes jointly referred to as the social media triad of you twit face. No, this, this is not a recent development with, tech, with technology. Even back there in the first century, Paul writes to believers in Corinth, and he tells them, the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. See, those strongholds, are uh, they're fortified places. This is a biblical idea of a stronghold. There are all kinds of notions of strongholds floating around out here, you know, where 
where uh, demons are hiding behind every rock and they're, you know, they're controlling cities and regions and stuff like that. It's a, it's a lot of nonsense. These strong, Paul defines what he means by these strongholds here. These strongholds are fortified places of wrong belief. They are uh, wrong thinking in our minds. These fortified places are in our minds. Paul says it's all speculations. It's every, it's every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God. We're called to eliminate not just misleading arguments, but to eliminate the very reasoning patterns that produce such arguments and bring every thought captive to obey Christ. So the question, see, the big question is, what's shaping the way we think? What shapes the way we fail to think. What has erected and what maintains these mental structures and thought patterns in our minds? What worldview is shaping our lives? Is it radical individualism? Is it modernism, postmodernism, existentialism, philosophical pluralism, relativism, selfism? Uh, these, these aren't intellectual parlor games, folks. These are... These are all related and powerfully active ideologies in our culture, and they are flooding you in a propaganda campaign. They are selling you on another narrative than God in the war to shape and control your thinking and your mind. Uh, this has always been a pivotal strategy in the struggle between the seed of the serpent and the seed of of the woman. And what makes this so especially dangerous these days is what we started out with a little while ago, this stunning crisis of biblical illiteracy. Uh, for example, in that book, Stephen Prothero noticed, he said he noticed that his students at Boston University didn't seem to get the most basic references that he made to religion. They just didn't even get it. He said he might mention Matthew, and uh, having said something, and he said and he, he realized his students were thinking, Matthew? Matthew who? Matthew Perry? And so he realized he couldn't take anything for granted. He had to explain everything. Matthew which is one of the four Gospels, which are books in the New Testament, which is one of two sections of Scripture in Christianity, which is one of the world's major religions. Now he said, that's not too much of a stretch as to where he had to start with university students at Boston University. And that's when he started giving a little, I think the book grew partly out of this. He started giving a little religious literacy quiz to his students. Fifteen questions, super basic things about world religions. And he said the students did really badly. Most flunked, he said. Most couldn't list the four gospels. One gave it a shot, Matthew, Mark, Luther, and John. Yeah, well, close. Uh, only one out of eight, he said, could name the first five books of the Hebrew Bible, the Pentateuch, the Old Testament. Only one in six, one in six knew that blessed are the poor in spirit is a quote from what may be the most important piece of oratory in history, the Sermon on the Mount. And they were exceptionally creative when it came to the matching part. Match. Yeah. You know, it was Paul who bound Isaac. It was Noah who led the exodus of the Israelites out of Babylon. Moses is the one who received the dove's olive branch. Abraham was the guy that was blinded on the road to Damascus. And so on. And he said, the problem gets no better. You know, 
on a larger scale and across, uh, across every age group. When average folks on the street in New York were asked basic questions about the Bible, the results were, again, stunningly bad. God, they said, created Eve from an apple. It's got some elements in there, I guess. Jacob gave his son Joseph a new car. Matthew was swallowed by a whale. And I mean, it's not limited to just like Manhattan. Scientific surveys in general reveal only about half of American adults can name even one of the four Gospels. Most Americans can't name the first book of the Bible, the first book. Only one-third, only one-third know that Jesus and not Billy Graham delivered the Sermon on the Mount. A quarter of Americans think the book of Acts is in the Old Testament. A third more is just, just admit they don't know where it is. 10% of Americans believe Joan of Arc was Noah's wife. That makes sense, right? And they say that uh, Lot's wife was a pillar of salt by day and a ball of fire by night. <laughs> Just like, what are you talking about? He's <laughs> <laughs> Just like... I don't know what to do with that. Yeah, one more I saw, and the Catholics would appreciate it more. They said Jesus was born because Mary had an immaculate contraption. <laughs> I don't know what's happening. What's going on there is just called basic factual illiteracy. No familiarity with the basic Bible information, you know, events and people and places, keywords and that kind of thing. That's bad enough. But then there are folks who have some, they, they have some factual biblical literacy. They know some Bible words and stories and books and verses and so on. But they have no idea how to put it all together. How does all this fit together? That's another level of illiteracy called story illiteracy. You got factual illiteracy, but some people got some facts, but they have story illiteracy. They don't know how any of this fits together. No grasp of what's called the meta narrative. How all the bits and pieces fit together into the whole grand drama of redemption. So in that case, that, that's when the Bible just becomes kind of a book of quotes, you know? hop around in randomly and find stuff you like, kind of the religious equivalent of Grimm's fairy tales. It's just kind of a mixed bag of interesting stories that teach us some basic lessons and motivate us to be better people. And that's when the Bible just becomes that kind of thing. Let me just say right here, the Bible, the Bible is not a self-help book. Should I say that again? The Bible is not a self-help book. It's not a magic charm. You know, we can hold, rub, wave around, make things, good things happen. The Bible's not like the magic eight ball thing. You know, you just shake it and out pops an answer. The Bible doesn't exist just to make us feel better. We can call that the Xanax approach. The Bible's not like a pinball machine, you know, you just you just fire you just fire the pinball of ignorance out to bounce around from text to text to text without any direction, without any method, without any context, and just hope you hit the jackpot. The Bible's not a catalog for religious uh, shoppers to pick and choose a good fit for their spiritual preferences. That's not what the Bible is. The Bible's not any of these things. And that's why this course, that's where this course on the story of the Bible is, is going to help us read the Bible 
on its own terms. Read it for what it really is. That's kind of like one of the goals of what we're doing with a course like this. And that's the way only, legitimately, that's the way to get to what the Bible actually teaches. See, it is possible to know a lot about what the Bible says and still be lost when it comes to the critical matter of what the Bible teaches. Those are different things. Let me tell you how many times people have said to me, well, the Bible says. And I'm like, yeah, well, what's it teaching by saying that? That's, that's the question. And you can only get to what the Bible teaches by putting together what the Bible says rightly. That's why so many folks are stuck at the level, another level called meaning illiteracy. They're stuck there because they don't know how to interpret the story and its parts to arrive at what the truth is that God has actually revealed and what the Bible means by what it says. And finally, of course, all those levels of illiteracy, factual illiteracy, story illiteracy, meaning illiteracy, they all end up finally in practical illiteracy where, where folks just don't know how the Bible applies here and now in their messy, hard, real lives. They, they end up approaching the Bible narcissistically. <laughs> that is, they just read their own self-focused, self-centered notions and desires and priorities and biases and wishes and the like. They read those into bits and pieces of the Bible and then sanctify it all with the pious, you know, well, God told me. And, you know, my response is, yeah, not really. Like the lady who said, God told her to divorce her husband and marry another man with whom she was already romantically involved. And she argued she was, she was biblically justified in doing this because of Paul's command in Ephesians 4.24, in the authorized King James Version, that says to put off the old man <laughs> and put on the new man. You just like, what is going on? And apparently she was abs that's a true story. Apparently absolutely serious. What was she doing? She's reading her own meaning, one that both clears her and satisfies her. She's reading that into really just a couple phrases from a text. A text, by the way, which is actually about replacing just such a sinful lifestyle with a true Christian lifestyle. Listen, the God who is has spoken. And nothing is of greater concern for us than to know and submit to what he has really said. Remember last fall, Pastor Josh, he was he spent a whole class on the doctrine of revelation, the truth. God has revealed himself and revealed his will. God has not left us guessing, wondering, speculating about what story we're in and what he wants. We're not, thank goodness, we are not left in league with the old 4th century B.C. Greek philosopher a guy by the name Metrodorus of Chios. He was a pre-Socratic from the school of Democritus. Uh, th this cat named Metrodorus of Chios famously said at one point, listen to this now. He said, none of us knows anything, not even this very thing, whether we know or don't know, nor do we know what it is not to know, nor if there is anything or not. What? what are you talking about? <laughs> what does that mean? Well, I, I don't know. Reminds me of one of the first definitions of philosophy I ever read. Man's attempt to befuddle himself scientifically, which I agreed with. Or maybe this question fits better. What do you get when you cross the Godfather with a philosopher? get an offer you can't understand. 
Yeah. Problem's not philosophy, of course, per se. Philosophy is just basically the love of wisdom. The problem's bad philosophy. What Paul calls empty, deceitful philosophy. Metrodorus' skepticism, that's really bad, empty, deceitful philosophy. When all is said and done, we know that not knowing is not an option, right? We've already touched on this in Romans 1, because what can be known about God is plain. Why? Because God has made it plain. <laughs> That's why. There is, as Tom Wright says, there is the echo of a voice. I like that language. The reason we dream of a better world, a world where we belong, a world where we fit, a world where everything fits as it should, where everything is right, the reason we dream of that is because we've come from such a place. The ancient garden, where in the beginning all was very good, the way it's supposed to be. The reason we think we've heard a voice, because there really is a voice. Someone speaking, calling. Where are you? And this is critical, true. The God who is, speaks, and he has spoken. He's spoken in creation, as we're talking about just then, general revelation in nature, in history, in ourselves, in our minds, in our awareness, in our consciences, in our spiritual capacities. He's spoken by the prophets in special revelation at many times, in many ways, as they were moved by the Spirit of God. And now in these last days, the writer to the Hebrews said, he's spoken to us in huio. He's spoken to us in and by his son. And all that God has said that we need to hear, all that God has shown that we need to see, all that God has done that we need to know, all that God has explained that we need to understand, all is now written here in the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments. God's acts and God's interpretation of his acts. So we're not left in skepticism and relativism and uncertainty and doubt and darkness and hopelessness. There is, and Josh mentioned this when we were starting tonight, there, there is a real extra cosmic place to stand. There is a foundation from outside of us and outside of all creation that will stand forever. So one of the things we're doing here is working hard to guard ourselves against biblical illiteracy at all levels for ourselves and also for our witness in the world. And we're doing that by getting a working knowledge and a firm understanding of God's story revealed in the whole Bible, so that we can find our own place in his story. God's people, in God's place, under God's rule and blessing. That's the definition of the kingdom from the beginning, all the way through Scripture. The kingdom that was and is and is to come. So here's a big picture framework. Man, the clock's just moving on. Big picture framework. If you take a look at just about any guide to writing a good story with a coherent plot, you'll find uh, that a number of essential pieces go into plot development. Now, they may be called by different names, but in essence, you'll always find four crucial elements. They're called exposition, complication, climax, and resolution. Those are primary elements of any good plot, critical elements. And not surprisingly, of course, the biblical storyline proceeds right along this pattern, as we should expect since God is the author of authoring. 
I'm not saying that we measure whether the Bible's a good and coherent story on the basis of whether it meets our guidelines. That's not what's happening. I'm saying that as creatures created in the image of God, we recognize the elements that make for a good, coherent plot in a story. And we do so because that's part of the way God has structured reality itself. We just recognize it when we see it. So it's not surprising that his word, his story, displays this very structure right here. Exposition is just the basic information um, needed to understand the story. It's the opening move in the plot line, and it establishes the necessary framework for the unfolding of the whole story. Complication is the catalyst. It's the incident that introduces major conflict into the story. Climax is the turning point in the story when it becomes clear uh, how the complication is going to be resolved. And resolution is the set of events that brings the story to a close. And these plot movements help us answer the questions everyone asks and ultimately must answer. Where did we come from? What went wrong? What is the solution to what's wrong? Where is history and we along with it, where is all of this ultimately going? It's all answering these questions. And in the Bible's long and multi-layered story, these plot elements correspond to four major plot movements in the Bible. The first is creation, Genesis 1 and 2, that's the exposition. Second is the fall. That's the complication in the plot line. That's Genesis 3. Redemption is the climax, This especially in the birth, life, death, resurrection, ascension of Jesus. And, uh, and then finally, new creation is the resolution. So creation, where did everything come from? We'll start, we'll get here next week, Genesis 1 and 2 gives us the account of God's creation of all things, including humanity. We're the only creatures in all of creation that are God's image bearers. And this initial section of the Bible, the exposition, is packed with meaning and filled with theological significance. An entire, an entire framework is set in place in these first two chapters, only within which that framework does the rest of the story make any sense. The first move in the plot line, foundational to everything else that Scripture teaches. So this, this sets the stage for the Bible's unfolding drama. Genesis 1 and 2, we meet several key characters. We first start to grasp the setting for Scripture's story. We learn several major themes and patterns that will progressively be unpacked through the later covenants, all working toward an ultimate end. And then comes the fall, the complication in the plot line. Genesis 3, which reveals the problem, the terrible dilemma that we all face. And, you know, here's where we learn what went wrong. And things went badly wrong. In Genesis 3, everything changes. The world God made, including his relationship with his created image bearers. From Genesis 3 on, we are now by nature at odds with God. And here's the other side of that coin. He is at odds with us. Adam, the first man, forever changed the direction of space-time history with his choice to rebel against God. And uh, when tempted, he disobeyed God's clear command. He plunged the whole human race into sin and death and condemnation. This second big move in the plot line establishes the terrible problem that the rest of Scripture then goes on to address. Apart from Genesis 3, you can't make any good sense of God's glorious plan of redemption. If you get the problem wrong, you get the solution wrong. 
the massive question that creates such crushing tension in the story is how can sinful, re rebellious human beings ever be acceptable before the triune holy God given sin's impurity and pollution? How can you and I ever stand before God without being condemned? That's the question comes to the fore right there. When the psalmist asks over in Psalm 24, who shall ascend the hill of the Lord, who shall stand in his holy place, and then answers, he who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not lift up his soul to what is false and does not swear deceitfully, that is a death sentence for you and me and for us all. The whole great biblical theme of redemption comes to the fore right here. Can anything be done for us? Or, as in the case of the fallen angels, is there nothing to look forward to but the judgment of the great day? Well, that's the question. And of course, that brings us to the next big move in the plot line, which is redemption. The broken, condemned, hopeless world is immediately given a promise of healing and freedom and hope, a promise of, of redemption in Genesis 3.15. God promises that the seed of the woman, a human offspring, will one day come to crush the enemy who brokered and brought about this fall in Eden. And although we merit nothing but death for our sin, that's the wages. That's what we've earned. Death will not have the last word. In fact, death itself will be put to death. And the rest of the Bible after Genesis 3, all the stories, all the details in the whole storyline, the people, the sacrificial system, the, the saving events like the Exodus, all of it is slowly unpacking this initial promise of good news, which at last will be fulfilled in the person and work of Jesus Christ. And that work, of course, is his perfect life and atoning death and his resurrection from the dead. Through his incarnate son, the father creates a new humanity, the church, that can enjoy the full forgiveness of sin and new hearts and uninhibited access to the father through the spirit, the fall crippled God's original intention for his image bearers, but Christ redeems it through his work on the cross. We fell by our own work at one tree, yet we're redeemed by another's work at another tree. Right? And we receive all the benefits of the work of Christ done for us by grace alone, through faith alone, trusting the promise he makes to us. This, this is the turning point in the story. When the way the conflict is resolved becomes clear, when the way of reconciliation is open, everything before this leads to this. Everything after this flows from this and points back to this. And that's the bulk of biblical revelation and the heart of the gospel. See. Like again, like Psalm 24. Psalm 24 is not telling us to go, you know, go make our hearts pure and our hands clean, then we can climb into the presence of God. I sadly have heard that preached that way. Here's, here's what you got to do. Go do this. No, as soon as you read beyond verses 3 and 4 in Psalm 24, you find out Christ is a person in view there. Lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up that the King of glory may come in. Who's this King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He's the King of glory. So Psalm 24 is not some Gnostic song about us cleaning ourselves up and climbing the mountain of God into God's presence. It's a gospel ascension song about God, about God's victory over sin and death. The king of glory is the ascended Lord, mighty in battle, through whom the Father disarmed the rulers and authorities. 
and put them to open shame by triumphing over them. Of him, the writer to the Hebrews says, after making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. He doesn't say, after we purified ourselves and purged our thoughts and cleansed our affections, changed our behavior, and ascended the hill, we can finally gain victory and see God in his holy place. No. He says, after Christ had provided purification for sin, our sin, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty. It's Christ's purifying work. It's Christ's battle against the forces of darkness. It's Christ's triumph over sin and death that saves us. He's the only one who ever lived on earth about whom it can truly be said he has clean hands and a pure heart. As for the rest of us, Jeremiah says the heart is deceitful above all things, and desperately sick. God himself says to the prophet Jeremiah, you can try to wash away your guilt with a strong detergent. You can use as much soap as you want but the stain of your guilt is still there for me to see. Whew. Sin has so stained us that even the best works of the finest Christians in this life are filthy rags. If there's no one righteous, not even one, then who's going to ascend the hill of the Lord ever? If we were to stand on our own in that holy place, we would perish instantly. So if our hands aren't clean, our hearts aren't pure, and we can't make them so, what hope is there for us? Well, Christ, our righteousness. It's Adam's and Eve's hope, trying to cover themselves before God, the little fig leaf garment. <laughs> Nothing. Later, when Israel tries to cover herself with her own righteousness, God mocks that vain attire in Isaiah 59, saying, their cobwebs are useless for clothing. They cannot cover themselves with what they make. But the redeemed cry out, just a couple of chapters later in Isaiah, the redeemed cry out, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall exult in my God, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. And that, that's the Bible's testimony all the way through. The only robe that is allowed in God's holy place is the one that clothes the wearer with Christ's perfect righteousness before him. And at last, see, will come a new creation. In light of all these other movements in the plot line, where's all of history going? Well, it's going toward the goal and the end of God's redeeming promise. This present order, is the old creation in Adam, but Christ will bring a new creation through his life and death and resurrection. He's already initiated, already inaugurated this new creation in his death and resurrection. And every believer born from above, every believer who is born anew right now is part of that new creation now. And when he returns, he'll bring that to its fullness, and the plot will be resolved. And the story will be consummated. So we wait for the fullness to break in on that day. As C.S. Lewis would say, when the author steps onto the stage and the story is brought to a close. And the old creation gives way to the new creation. When the corrupted heavens and earth are replaced by a new heaven and a new earth. When paradise lost becomes paradise regained. And the closed way to the tree of life is opened again forevermore. What we'll learn uh, through the course is that all of scripture has this Christological focus. The Bible has a storyline. The story has a point. And it's all about Christ. Everything before him leads to him. Everything after him flows from him, especially in his death and resurrection. He is the central subject. 
the interpretive key, the integrative principle of the whole Bible. That doesn't mean we just attach, you know, a lesson about Christ from the Old Testament onto the end of every Old Testament text in just some kind of artificial way. Uh, that wouldn't be reading the Bible on its own terms. Uh, we're not just looking for some evangelistic add-on at the end of every passage, some artificial connection to the cross. We're trying to draw out the connection with Christ and the cross that is already there in the whole storyline. The scriptures themselves make it perfectly clear that Christ is intrinsic. He is fundamental and central to the whole Old Testament narrative. And if we read that story, if we teach it or preach it without finding the real and intended connection to Christ, then we have simply missed the point. So nail this down is foundational. Christ is the focus of the whole Bible. He's the center point of the big story. He's there at creation. All things were made by him. The fall shows us our great need of him. The flood points to the judgment of God on sin and our need for a God-ordained safe passage into the new world. God's blessing to Abraham was the inauguration of the particular line from which Christ came. The Exodus was a redemption of God's people pointing forward to our deliverance by Christ. The law reveals sin and properly understood brings us to see our need of Christ. The sacrifices train our minds to understand that putting away sin always costs a life. The offices of prophet and priest and king are all categories to help us better grasp who Jesus is. The prophet speaks the very word of God to the people. The priest presents the people to God and intercedes on their behalf. The king alone has the right and the responsibility of sovereign rule. In the Old Testament, the books of the law lay the foundation of Christ. The historical books illustrate the coming of the kingdom of Christ. In the poetical books, the people look up in aspiration for Christ. In the prophetical books, they look forward in expectation of the Christ. The Gospels give us a fourfold manifestation of Christ. Acts records the propagation and the proclamation of the Christ. The epistles interpret and apply Christ's person and work. And Revelation shows all things being brought to consummation in Christ. From the start, the portrait of Christ grows clearer and clearer until the day he appears in our bill who will take sin away. Like Abraham, he will trust and obey God. Like Joseph, he will save many lives. Like Joshua, he will do everything written in the book of the law. Like David, he will be divinely exalted from humble circumstances. Like Solomon, he will rule with great wisdom. The Old Testament is not backward focused. This is staggeringly important. The revelation in the Old Testament points us forward in aspiration for and expectation of the one who is to come, who we then find revealed in the New Testament as Jesus from Nazareth. The fulfillment of the law and prophets, and then we're pointed forward in hope yet again to his coming and the second time to bring everything to final resolution. This, this is the story that we really are in. This is a story for seeing, for growing, for guarding, for spreading, and getting it right matters. We aim to become disciples who know the things to be believed, right? The facts, the essential themes, the chief components of the biblical story from beginning to end so that we become disciples who know the things to be loved. Before Christ, our disordered loves produced disordered lives. That's always true. But in Christ, we're given new life, new purposes, new desires. Our loves are reordered, and so our lives are too. 
in and by the truth. And so we become disciples at last who know the things to be done. Right belief, right love are what lead to an end in right practice in very concrete ways in our lives and in our life together. So, as we venture into this fall course of the Institute, may the Lord sanctify us, set us apart in the truth. His word is truth. This is the way. This is the story we really are in. And finding your place in it among God's people, well, that's the difference in how and where the story ends for you. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for uh, the time to begin to think about these, these crucial things and to begin to think uh, uh, carefully about your word to us and how we are to read and understand it. May you bless this to our good and your glory in this place, and we thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen.